Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sim City Preacher. I want to talk about a, a new subject. Matter of fact, it's so new, I doubt very much that any of you have heard about this at all. Unless uh, you're one of the few people that I have brought this subject up to, you know, privately. But I do believe that this subject is fascinating. I just began learning about this recently, I, and I want to continue studying it, and I am at the point now where I have not made a, uh, a decision that that I'm confident that this is correct. But uh, the more I learn about it, the more I'm um, uh, understanding it, uh, the more I'm leaning towards the idea that this very well may be correct. And if so, this could actually revolutionize uh, the way that we understand some of Paul's writings. Now, uh, there's several resources that I'm drawing from uh, to give you this information, um, but there is a link that I will attach uh, to the description box here of, uh, of an article that I'm going to be referring to. However, this is, this is not the first uh, source that I came across that uh, brought this subject to my attention. The first time I ever heard about prosopopopia, prosopopopia, took me a while to even figure out you know, how it's pronounced. The first time I heard the word, the first time the subject was introduced to me, was um, on a, um, a video by uh, Michael Harden. Now, I've watched uh, a lot of his videos uh, now, and I think he's got some really good ideas. However, I wanted to make it very clear that I am not endorsing Michael Harden, uh, his teachings on the Bible. I think some of his conclusions are not only wrong, but very, very seriously wrong. However, um, just because somebody's wrong in, in one way or two ways doesn't mean that everything they've ever said is wrong. And in this case, I think that the idea of propo uh, pro, uh, pro, pro, <laughs> propo proposia uh, is it, it, very likely to be correct. So the but the article that I'm going to uh, refer you to, if you want the complete article, because I'm taking excerpts from it in this talk right now, the article is titled Ru uh, uh, "Ruminating Romans." Was Paul a diatribalist? Diatribalist uh, from the root word diatribe. In other words, did Paul use the technique of diatribe? <clears throat> now, diatribe is an, another word that um, I think is, is being used uh, in the same way that we use pro, pro, uh, pro, pro <laughs> sopopia. Um, prosopopopia. Uh, now, the more I say that word, the harder it is for me to pronounce it. So, I uh, I'm going to put the link to so you can watch to get the full article if you want to. But let me lay a little bit of groundwork uh, before I get into this uh, this article and this topic, uh, based upon 
some of the teaching that I've done now for nine years on YouTube, I would refer you to my playlist uh, titled Early Church History. Also, to my playlist, uh, The Book of Acts, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. Now, when I say a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, I mean that I personally am reading the Book of Acts a verse at a time and commenting, giving you my thoughts, my interpretation, my teaching on each of these verses. So I'm not referring to some other commentator, or some famous commentator. No, it's just my own comments. Uh, now, uh, also, I have a playlist titled James and Paul, The Shocking Facts. Um, those playlists are all relevant to this subject uh, because really all of the playlists are really emphasize this basic truth. And that is that uh, from the time of uh, Pentecost, which I, I believe is the beginning of the church, beginning of the church uh, that when I say the church, I'm talking about the believers who are indwelt and sealed with the Holy Spirit. Before Pentecost, we find a lot of examples uh, in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, uh, before his ascension, before Pentecost, we find occasions where um, there are people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that means that the Holy Spirit enters them and empowers them to perform miracles or do some kind of ministry work. But the filling of the Holy Spirit is a temporary thing, whereas on Pentecost, for the first time in history, it was possible for mankind to be indwelled and sealed with the Holy Spirit permanently. And that's really what a Christian is. Uh, the, the Bible basically says that the definition of a, a Christian is someone who has the Holy Spirit living in them. And how do you get the Holy Spirit living in you? Only one way. You must put your faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. You must be, rely on Him completely for your salvation, believing that you make no contribution to your salvation. Salvation does not hinge upon your performance and your behavior, but salvation is based entirely on the fact that it's a free gift that Jesus offers everyone and you chose to receive the gift by putting your faith in Jesus and believing that the work he did paying for your sins on the cross is sufficient and your sins are paid for and because of what he did for you and his promise of eternal life to you that you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. So this is what we believe, and when we do believe that, then we get baptized with the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit comes into us. Uh, we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit continues living in us, and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That means that the Holy Spirit is in us permanently and will never leave us, and we can never lose our salvation. So uh, before Pentecost, people... Uh, there are examples of the Spirit coming into them temporarily. Uh, but the reason I'm mentioning this is because Pentecost is where the church began. And after that point in time, uh, until the end of the book of Acts, roughly around 60, 65 AD, uh, the book of Acts is a history of those first 30 approximately 30 years of church history. And we learn from the book of Acts, and also in my playlist, The Study of Early Church History, uh, we, we learn that uh, the, the church went through a transition period. Uh, at the very beginning of the church, uh, it was made up only of Jews. Uh, not, there was not one Gentile Christian until 10 years after Pentecost. The first one being Cornelius and his family. God sent Peter, not Paul, to preach to the Gentiles first. And he, he preached this 
same uh, saving message that you and I believe, and that, that, that is that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That was the message he preached to Cornelius. And uh, so it took 10 years before uh, they, uh, the church understood that Gentiles are part of it. And then it took a long time after that for the uh, church to understand and accept the fact that Judaism had to be discarded. You see, um, first we had people who were Jews who practiced and believed in Judaism and, and the, the coming Messiah. Then we had the Savior came, died for our sins, and has gone up to heaven, and, and you have Jewish people who believe the Savior has come as Jesus Christ. But they were only Jews, and they practiced Judaism. So you had practicing Jews who believed in Jesus. Uh, and, and, then, and then we had uh, uh, Gentiles entering into it, and the question was, do the Gentiles have to become Jews in order to become a Christian? And that was really a debate and an argument at the beginning of the church. They first were expecting them to be, the Gentiles to be circumcised and, of course, follow the dietary laws and follow the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the Sabbath and, and then even, of course, temple worship and animal sacrifices. These things were, were all continuing to be practiced by the Jewish believers and the question was, should this be imposed upon the Gentiles too? So the church went through a transition period to be, first there were Jews, and then there were Jewish believers in Jesus, and then the Gentiles came in, and then the, the question is, uh, what role does Judaism play in all of this now? And uh, Paul, more than anybody else, uh, uh, declared that Judaism, uh, all the, the legalism and all the religiosity of Judaism must be totally discarded and left behind. So then the final phase of Christianity is, uh, instead of Judaism and Jesus, uh, and now it's Jesus without Judaism. And that's, that's what we're supposed to believe today. That's, what we're, uh, that's really what Christianity should have been, but it took decades in the beginnings of the church before that all got worked out and, and cleared up. Uh, now, so that, let's just say that this, this is the foundation of this, this teaching. And this, uh, Paul, uh, how many times in Paul's letters can you think of uh, Paul uh, having to deal with false teachers? See, the false teachers were uh, from Judea, were basically following Paul around and going to his churches where Paul taught them the gospel, that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And, and then the f false teachers were coming in saying, you've got to become a Jew, and then you can believe in Jesus. And Paul, of course, said that's another gospel. It's a false gospel. And even if there's an angel from heaven that tells you that, don't believe him. It's, it, it's, it's a cursed so that was Paul's real burden, is dealing with these false teachers, uh, the, the Judaizers. Uh, many of them, they came from the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and they, so this was the argument in the beginning of the church. And this is what is discussed in, these, primarily discussed in my playlist. Uh, early church history, verse by verse a commentary in the book of Acts, and uh, James and Paul shocking facts. Now, that brings me to the the term in, that we see in the Bible, thorn in the flesh. Um, I believe this is uh, almost universally misunderstood, and uh, I really had no confidence in in my understanding of uh, my that I really knew what the thorn in the flesh was, uh, just in, until recently, really just this last year, Brother Bill from, from England uh, taught me a new way of, of seeing it, and I'm convinced that it's the correct way. And if you will find the verse 
uh, when Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh, and then you back up a couple of chapters and read it uh, with the thought in mind that the thorn in the flesh is not a physical ailment, uh, but it is, I would, I would translate that in uh, uh, modern American language as instead of a thorn in my flesh, I would say a pain in my ass. In other words, you know some people that, even here on YouTube, I've had to deal with a lot of people that they really are a pain in my ass. They just continue to try to stir up trouble and cause division and, and just, and so they're a thorn in my flesh. And if you, if you will um, think of the term thorn in the flesh as a false teacher that is creating problems for Paul, wherever he goes, these, they're following him around and trying to ruin his churches. Uh, go back a couple of chapters, and when you read those chapters, uh, any references, uh, uh, th think of it in those terms, and you'll see that it makes sense. That the thorn in the flesh that Paul had to do, uh, endure uh, was uh, dealing with the false teachers. So really that brings me to the subject of this whole series I'm going to do. This being video number one, I expect there to be several videos, uh, and, and that is that um, Paul had to deal with the false teachers. Now, is the the, the concept of diatribe or, or proposia, uh, uh, does this apply to Paul's writings and, and, and regarding this idea that he's dealing with the false teachers? I'm going to pick that up uh, in the next video, so I hope you have enough interest and curiosity now to continue with me. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.